when you were giving that talk at the psychosocial, someone mm. asked you, and I thought it was like, actually like a, it was a, I was like, this person has chutzpah. Um, to be like, okay, but like, why Freud? I was like, we're in this seminar where everyone is pretty much. <laughs> and you yeah. gave this answer that was like, Freud is a brain worm, but like, don't, we all have it, but like, don't get it if you don't. <laughs> I was yeah. like, I thought I might ask you to, to not like do it as a bit, but just, yeah. I, I, I loved, I loved that image and I wanted our listeners to, to have it. That wasn't planned. I mean, that that's really how, how I think. <laughs> You know, and I think um, one of the things that I find sort of vaguely fascinating and dispiriting about our profession in general is that one is constantly not merely doing the work, but also defending the doing of the work. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, so there's often this sort of uh, requirement that one defends the, the very purpose of one's work. And I I think on some level that can only be a falsification. I don't. Yeah. I don't think that can accurately be uh, something that we can really do in good faith. Otherwise, it just becomes part of the work itself. And then the question is, well, why is that the thing? Um, and of course, in the background of all of this, I think is the question: you know, why are we not spending our lives volunteering in soup kitchens, or yeah. you know, um, spending our lives uh, protecting people, getting abortion care, and these kinds of? And you know, those are real questions. And I think you know, I ask myself those questions too. Um, but I think the only answers that I have to those questions, which are, I think, themselves, to some extent, Freudian answers, it's like, I don't think I'm totally responsible for these things. And I actually don't think that there are many things that I could do. There have been so few things, so few times in my life where I've experienced making a choice um, that it seems... You know, it would seem falsification to say this is why I do things this way. You know, I do things this way because this is the way I ended up doing it. And, uh, I I can't I can't defend them, and if, if I could, I don't think I'd want to. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. I was almost I I, I had a thought just to just to give what what you were just saying, Grace, about uh, like the the difficulty of, of like retrospectively. Uh, perceiving your motivations for things are sort of like these sort of like having to create storages that have a point of origin and the point of origin is sort of a myth. But I, there was this one line that I just found, or I guess it's a series of lines from Please Miss that I, I just found just absolutely beautiful. And it, I, I'm just going to read it and we can cut it or paste it or not, but, but it was this bit, but I always knew is an especially unreasonable standard by which to rank the legitimacy of various transitions because it implies two things. One, that it was always true Two, that we have consistent access to truths about ourselves. Even if one is true, and I have my doubts, both in my own case and as a matter of political strategy, two is obviously nonsense. Even the knowledge of one's own desires, let's say of one's sexual object choices, is subject to refinement, even if the rough contours remain consistent. I thought that was just beautiful. Just like, and, like, and, 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 mm. and I, I want to sort of signal my appreciation for your work more generally, because like this is a... It, it, it states elegantly in a way that sort of renews the neglected obviousness of of like psychoanalytic insight, <laughs> and, mm -hmm. I, and I think there's so much else that happens in your book that does this. And I just wanted to say that that line in general was, was iconic for me, and I'm so glad you've written these two books and and, and others. But yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, that, that's 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 really uh, that's, that's really powerful and really meaningful to hear. I mean, one of the things that. Um, but I think it is not an excuse or an apologia for that book in particular, but it's certainly part of the context is that um, it is a common enough experience for people who are embarking on what, what I prefer to call a sex change, but, you know, whatever one wants to call it, it's a common enough experience to look around and feel utterly dispirited with the narratives about transition that are publicly available to such an extent that such dissatisfaction is almost itself the point of embarkation actually mm -hmm. um and and in, and in sense this sort of sense of frustration not with the cis world but with the trans world mm. is i think something that trans people often have in common which can cause all kinds of problems both politically and socially but you know you you end up feeling a little bit or i ended up feeling a little bit like a sort of um blakey and romantic where you kind of think i must i must create my own system or uh, or, or, or become subject to someone else's. Mm -hmm. And I'm not entirely sure whether I think there is in these books a systematic theory, um, either of psychoanalysis or of transition. I go back and forth on that. Um, but I do think that there is 
a way in which whatever whatever there is in these books, I come by it honestly. It came from mm-hmm. a place of genuine intellectual need. Yeah. And so one of the things that I take you to be saying about those lines in particular, Patrick, which I really appreciate, is that, you know, that notion that we don't have consistent access to truths about ourselves and the truths themselves may change. Again, you know, that is, uh, I, I think, day, day one of psychoanalysis school. It's certainly not an original insight in itself. If it feels original to me when I'm writing it, which I think it does, it's not because I'm stupid and I'm encountering it for the first time. It's because I'm encountering a need for it for yeah. the first time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that that need is, I think, one of the, uh, the ju- again, not justifications, but you know, one of the contexts for, for some of this book's quirks. That the the memoirs quirks especially, but also pleasure and efficacy. Yeah, I, I think about the question of methodology too, and I know we'll talk about this more. But just a, the, another line that I found myself again, you know, like circling in the ebook and then printing out and highlighting it just to really drive it home. Right? Is is this? Is that bit where you're like, my only normative method is the non-method of transliberation for which, as it happens, I believe psychoanalysis may indeed be more useful than its reputation would suggest. And this is, I, I think Abby and I were both like, like trilling over how wonderful that is. I mean, yeah. Part, yeah. We, we, have, we have gone around quoting a lot of these things. We have actually been quoting a lot of the King's two anuses. Yeah. Um, that oh, has really? been, that yeah. has been cool. a source yeah. of, of a lot of pleasure. Um, I mean, I, I, in this household, we do go around just like, that is like whatever we're both reading, um, like being like, you need to to stop and, and listen and and this has been like very very delightful um for for that um so i'm really glad to hear that yeah yeah that's so. what it's for i guess <laughs> a podcast about psychoanalysis, politics, pop culture, and the ways we suffer now. I'm Abby Kluchin. I'm Patrick Blanchfield. And today we are really delighted to introduce Grace Lavery. Um, Grace is a writer and academic who lives in New York. She has written four books that we want to tell you about. Um, Quaint, (laughs) Exquisite, Um, Please Miss, a memoir, which we're definitely going to be talking about. Pleasure and Efficacy of Pen Names, Cover Versions, and Other Trans Techniques, which just came out um, and which we're going to get into a lot today. And then forthcoming from Duke University Press, Closures, Heterosexuality, and the American Sitcom. And less formally, I just want to say... Grace has been on our list to interview since the day that we conceived this podcast. Um, that sounded more sexual than I wanted it to, but sorry, right, we'll, <laughs> we'll leave it in. Um, her work on, on psychoanalysis is just unbelievably brilliant. Um, and uh, I love reading her work. I love the way that she turns a phrase. Um, she's an incredible wordsmith. Um, and also just somebody that you want to think with who, you know, as you're interacting with her on the page, I think brings out something that maybe you wanted to be able to have the words for. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's, so it's an experience that we want our listeners to be able to have. So Grace, thank Mm -hmm. you so much for making the time to be here. Welcome. Thank you so much. And what a, what a beautiful, um, and generous introduction. Thank you. I, um, one of the things when I'm staying up late all night wondering uh, if I'm all sizzle and no steak and, you know, that I, that I have no, that the work is just sort of empty fluff. Um, one of the things that I think about often is that the, the work that has most motivated me to think often has been um, accused of the same thing. <laughs> and so, uh, <laughs> you know, I think when you say that there's something in this work that uh, makes, you, makes you want to think with it, yeah, you know, I, I think that's maybe how I feel about about D. A. Miller and even mm. Eve Sedgwick, uh, who are, who I've criticised quite a bit. Um, who and and maybe, maybe that maybe that's good. Maybe that will maybe that will calm my nighttime anxieties. Um, I will say, as I have been, you know, I've I've read a lot of your work as it's come out, um, 
but having like immersed myself in it recently in advance of this, um, I, I've heard you talk about and also have read you on Eve Sedgwick. And I have to tell you that like there are, if there is anybody that your writing reminds me of, it is Sedgwick. Yeah. So I, I, who is, you know. I, I'm honored by that. Okay. She's an incredible stylist and yeah. an incredible critic and incredibly perceptive. And, you know, there is so much that I admire about Eve Sedgwick. And I wouldn't make the criticisms that I do if I didn't find the body of work. Um, utterly persuasive in, in other respects and necessary, consistently necessary. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So can I ask you a little bit about your path to psychoanalysis? And you can understand that however you want, but, you know, what role does does psychoanalytic thought play in, in your life, in your work, in your thinking, relationships, mm-hmm. politics, however you want to understand that question? Yeah, so, you know, I... I think that the first time I started to take psychoanalysis seriously as as a body of work was when I was in grad school and I had something of a kind of emotional crisis. I'm an alcoholic and a transsexual, so these are not, there are not a small number of those in the course of my life. And I felt a need for some kind of uh, therapeutic intervention. And our mutual friend, Jessica Rosenberg, Mm -hmm. actually, suggested who I was at grad school with and you know who is you know one of the smartest people I've ever met Jessica said something like it you know it might be worthwhile trying to as well as finding a kind of short-term intervention you know it might it might be worth trying to find some kind of therapist who would just be able to listen um, I, I didn't at that time I think really understands the sharp distinction that existed between talk therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy say as the sort of dominant um, form of practice, I, you know, and I, I don't think it had occurred to me that the difference between the two was an intellectual difference until those conversations with with Jessica. Um, and then, you know, early on in our grad school, in our time in grad school together, she she said in this really uh, nomic way. Jessica always has this uh, condition of being able to sort of see. She always sounds like she can see the future, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> and she's reporting back from the future. And she said something like, um, I think that the ethics of psychoanalysis is going to be very important to you. Mm. Uh, you know, I had no idea what that meant. And I, I later learned that maybe, in fact, she was referring to the sixth seminar right. in Jacques Le Pont, which <laughs> yeah. I, I have, I've never asked her because whenever I've asked her about these, these nomic statements, she tends to say either tactfully or otherwise that she, uh, that she doesn't remember delivering them, which just increases the magical power. But anyway, I think it was Jessica <laughs> who really encouraged me uh, to, to, to start looking. And the reason why I wanted to mention that was because for the first, you know, the first phase of my relationship to psychoanalysis through grad school, it was pretty much just a therapy for me. I was in full time psychoanalysis at grad in, during grad school. I went and sat on the went went and lay on the couch four times a week and then five times a week. Damn. Those sessions were utterly revelatory. My analyst was uh, brilliant, a trainee analyst, former academic who was making the kind of transition from academia into psychoanalysis. And it was a really wonderful experience. I, one of the things that I remember about it very powerfully was that I would simply deliver ideas that I would later, after the session, transcribe and then write up and they would simply become essays. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember one session that I wrote an essay, more or less start to finish in a session, which was an essay about Peter Pan. I still never published this, but I, <clears throat> it's a smart essay. I'm, I'm pleased with it. And one day it'll come out. One day I'll find a home for it, a purpose for it. Um, uh, anyway, yeah, I just I just delivered it then and there, again. But it, you know, the work with the, the, the Peter Pan essay was not about psychoanalysis. It wasn't it wasn't a psychoanalytic mm-hmm. essay. Mm-hmm. It was it was simply that it had come out under these psychoanalytic conditions. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that the, the turning point when I began to take psychoanalysis seriously as a framework for for intellectual work, for the work that I did in my day job, was not until I was already an assistant professor at UC Berkeley. And, you know, trying to think about how to put together my dissertation into a book, um, trying to find some way to make this kind of Japan, Britain, and Victorian studies connection mm-hmm. make sense within a kind of queer tradition, which seemed on the one hand so obvious to me, and on the other hand, something that I desperately did not want to reduce to mere historicism mm-hmm. or sort of to, to mere annotation or sociology. Um, so... That was that was how psychoanalysis became necessary for me intellectually, and I think, you know, the the kind of turning point in some ways that you know one of the turning points in my in my life and in my career was when um, 
my colleague and friend Kent Puckett uh, declined an invitation to speak to the San Francisco Center for Psychoanalysis mm. um, and suggested me uh, mm. instead. Uh, the, this, the, the topic, it was an amazing thing. It was a scientific meeting, which at SFCP is the, the uh, sort of like the big psychoanalytic uh, meeting. Everyone turns out. And uh, an analyst named Lisa Buckberg, B-U-C-H-B-E-R-G, was delivering a clinical paper um, on the TV show Girls Mm. and treating the TV show Girls as though it were a patient that she was, of whom she was doing a case study. Mm -hmm. And essentially the paper became about uh, the female Oedipal complex and penis envy. Mm -hmm. And... You know, it was fascinating to me because it was so different to the psychoanalysis that I'd seen people doing in um, in our humanities departments for a couple of different reasons. One, it, it was totally unabashed about the therapeutic dimensions of the work. Mm-hmm. Like it was, un- it was unembarrassed uh, in a way that I think we humanists are often embarrassed. And two, that central to that um, to that therapeutic work was this most ridiculous of Freudian concept, penis envy, Mm -hmm. which, you know, is just the mere phrase is often enough to discredit Freud. I mean, it's just like you say that and and everyone just sort of says, what on earth are you talking about? This is so obviously ridiculous. And so to see a bunch of feminist analysts, you know, engaging penis envy as though it were sort of critical and indeed, you know, positively useful way of thinking about the cultural reproduction of the body to, to me, that was totally revelatory. So I was asked to give a response p- to this paper about Lena Dunham and girls. Um, and then what I did actually was I took hold of a comment that Lena Dunham had made on Twitter, which was about the writer George Eliot. Mm-hmm. And uh, Lena Dunham had said uh, that she'd been reading Rebecca Mead's biography of George Eliot, thesis, colon, she was ugly and horny. <laughs> Um, And the and is in all caps. And, you know, I I think in a way, uh, that claim about George Eliot and the way in which it related to the claims that Lisa Buckberg was making about uh, penis envy and the uh, Oedipus, that really in some ways became the basis for pleasure and efficacy, Mm -hmm. uh, which is so much about uh, the horniness of the ugly um, and how the horniness of the ugly is connected to George Eliot in particular, not yeah. merely as a sort of receptacle, but actually is, you know, in some ways the primary theorist of ugly horniness. And so, yeah, I, I, I've never thanked Lena Dunham for that. I've never, I think this will be the first time I've publicly acknowledged Lena Dunham's role in, in the creation of this work. But yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I think that actually that that was pretty instructive and 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 Lisa Buckberg of course too amazing and so then that became the next project yeah 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 so i feel like that gives me a good segue to ask you to tell our listeners a little bit more about your new book um pleasure and efficacy and specifically um i mean we could get into Elliot more but i feel like that's that's, that's like a different podcast <laughs> possibly yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um although i yeah, i do have like lots of thoughts about Little Marsh and whatnot. Anyway, but specifically about the role that um, that Freud, uh, who I think you 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 called to me at one point in in an email, your, your pragmatic trans Freud. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Um, the role that Freud plays in it, um, and and in particular, mm. I wanted to ask about the part of the book um, where you say, you know, I think quite clearly that you are recovering parts of Freud and also parts of Freudianism to put to practical political Mm -hmm. use. Um, And I wonder if you talk, could talk a little bit about how you understand that project. Yeah. Um, And, and, and potentially also how I don't understand that project, because I think so much of this is stabbing around in the dark and trying to, you know, make something happen that it doesn't exactly know how to happen. But the, uh, well, this podcast began with the subject supposed yeah, to know so. and our like anxious relation uh, to it. Yeah. So, yeah. so I, you, yeah. this is like, you know, on very that much subject, the right space. Supposed to know. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I, uh, one of my grad students was texting me yesterday or the day before in profound frustration, at the difference between Gallup and Fink in mm. their account of 
metonym and metaphor in Lacan yeah. mm-hmm. and trying to get into the uh, Lacanian reading of Jakobson. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, we, we were exfoliating that over text together. This, you know, I guess is what, what, my, what my job looks like now. And I'm very honored by it. She's an incredible grad student. Um, and then at the end, I was just like, you know, on some level, I think that this does not, in fact, need to be an exhaustive systematic account, mm-hmm. um, accountable to structural linguistics in the way it sometimes seems like it has to be. Um, and at this point, I could tell that my student became uh, a little frustrated because I was brief, however briefly, relinquishing the role of sujet supposé savoir. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's such a necessary fiction for the kinds of work that sometimes grad school seems like it needs to do. And at the same time, you know, working through and past that fiction. So, the, my, you know, my student ended up writing, isn't there someone supposed to know this? Uh, and that was sort of the end of the, uh, uh, that was the end of the conversation, more or less. Anyway, yeah, so Pleasure and Efficacy, it's, uh, it's a book about uh, the ways in which transition has happened over the last 150 years. By transition, I more or less mean sex change, but without attempting to bracket that from other kinds of changes one might make to one's sense of oneself uh, in, in a body or in uh, legal and socially validated or visible forms of personhood. And more or less, the kind of central historical contention is that the emergence of sexuation as an ontology, that is to say there is an essential ontological difference, a difference in the very being and character of men and women, um, that this is one of the kind of great intellectual and political projects of modernity, yeah. if not the great intellectual and political project of modernity. And we call trans anything that has resisted that project mm-hmm. of uh, ontologizing sexuation or ontologizing um, sex. So the, the political necessity of that kind of work is probably quite obvious, which is that we are um, at a moment in history in which there is a profound and in, in some ways unprecedented uh, not in every way, but in some ways, unprecedented suppression of trans people um, across the world, uh, the kind of emergence of a singular modernity uh, organized around ontology and, and bodily ontology. And so I've wanted to resist that um, in the name of something like liberation, by which I mean simply just that people should be allowed to do whatever they want with their body, be whoever they choose in the world, um, and that we should form collective identities based on, you know, what actually matters to people rather than what they're told should matter to them. Mm. And that, that kind of freedom, uh, which I think of as a kind of collective struggle, uh, is one that I think necessitates not the kind of combating of an ontology with another ontology, but actually a, a way past ontology altogether. So, you know, what this means is, I think the line that trans people have often started to 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 repeat or to cling to is trans women are women. There's not a claim that I have any interest in contesting or, you know, or, sure. or, or negating in its own terms. But I think it, it, it says nothing especially interesting about the lives of trans people. Um, and it, um, it obscures quite a lot of hard work. So I wanted to bring the work to, um, I wanted to bring the work to light and to, to find new and better ways of, practicing freedom bodily freedom social mm-hmm. freedom political freedom i know this sounds horrifically naive but like the, these are the goals of the book you know to try to write a history of this particular kind of freedom mm-hmm. and so one of the ways in which psychoanalysis became really central to that project was because psychoanalysis seems to be the moment in the history of the western subject the history of western philosophy where suddenly uh, the ontology of sexuation had been radically thrown into question yeah. right. and utterly uh, undone as a piece of self-evident logic. Um, and the name that, that Freud gives to that undoing, I, I think, is castration complex penis envy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I know that other people would see other forms of undermined sexuation elsewhere, but it struck me as important that Freud was not an essentialist when it came to these mm-hmm. matters of sexual being. Mm-hmm. And, and, I, and I simply don't think that anyone, um, even the most ardent idealist version of Freud, could really uh, seriously claim otherwise. But then it seemed to me interesting and important and worth saying that there, there was this kind of humanistic attempt to 
reontologize Freud. That is to take yes, everything yes. in Freud that mm-hmm. is contingent and hypothetical and clinical, even, or to say based on observations of human beings whose case details um, sometimes we know, sometimes we don't, and take them as though they were in fact structuring myths of human essence. That is to say that mm-hmm. the Oedipal complex, let's say, uh, is something that necessarily governs the ways in which human beings grow up which I, I think is so obviously false mm-hmm. um, that, uh, you know, in order to think that was the case, you would need to think that Freud is a moron. And uh, and he clearly isn't one. So something is happening there that's a little bit different. So, you know, in other words, psychoanalysis became this really interesting testing ground for a set of claims about sexuation and sexual identity. And it, it was really clear to me uh that one of these was really going to be pretty useful and the other one wasn't. Yeah. What I, what I came to think was that, that Freud himself understood psychoanalysis as two things that were sometimes in conflict with each other, mm-hmm. those being uh, a system of knowledge, a system of, of figuring out how to know things, an epistemology, um, and on the other hand, a therapeutics, mm-hmm. a way of you know, trying to make people's suffering lessen, uh, to turn, um, you know, their hysterical uh, suffering into their average everyday suffering, as your uh, the title of this podcast indicates. And that ordinary unhappiness is sort of the goal of um, the therapeutic. But, you know, I think it's totally fair to say that Freud goes back and forth over his career between prioritizing one of these or the other. And there are moments where it really does seem as though the therapeutic has sort of left his view entirely. But at the same time, I was really unsatisfied with the normal way of narrating that, which was Freud started off with psychoanalysis as a therapy and ended it with a kind, as a kind of abstract philosophy. Right. I actually just don't, I plain don't think that's true. Mm-hmm. I don't think that that's, I don't think that's what happens in Beyond the Pleasure Principle. But even if it were what happens in Beyond the Pleasure Principle, uh, Freud wrote a lot of clinical things afterwards. And his mm-hmm. last work, in some ways, I think, you know, Maybe the greatest work of Freud's in some ways, the summer of his career, is analysis terminable and interminable, which mm-hmm. is a paper exclusively and explicitly concerned with the the possible recovery of the therapeutic underneath everything else. And it also seems totally fair to say that you know, one of the reasons why Freud was writing less clinical work in the second half of his career than in the first half was because he'd done the clinical work yeah. already. And it's not not as though people keep doing the primary research um, once they've done it. And so, you know, in, in a sense, I could I, I could imagine people would would find that the, the archive of psychoanalysis is therefore historically limited. But again, I think that's a that's to the benefit of psychoanalysis mm-hmm. is understanding this as an extraordinary depiction of what it felt like to be a suffering bourgeois woman in Austria in the last decade of the nineteenth century. I mean, that that is. Uh, we have an extraordinary archive of that, and it's called psychoanalysis. And we we learn um, a lot about those people and those lives from, from from that archive. You know, and again, it necessitates then, or at least it sort of um, capacitates doing something different with a new archive. And so that was that was part of what I was trying to do was to bring into the yeah. the center of this book this um, this other archive of trans people. Now, you know. I realize I've been talking for a long time, but it, one of the things that I think I have to say about all of that is like what, what I just gave was a very schematic and theoretical account of a book that actually spends quite a lot of time talking in exhaustive detail about literary texts and movies. Mm-hmm. The connection between those literary texts and movies and you know these, these broader claims about um, the negation of ontology in, in relation to sexuation, you know, that's something that I think I have to sort of hypothetically work out each time. Mm-hmm. But again, I, I do think that it's it's sort of licensed by psychoanalysis in any number of ways to try to to use cultural text as clinical data depicting and describing subjectivities, which is to say human beings negotiating the world in particular kinds of ways. So yeah, I don't know. This is why I think, let me put it this way. When I was a grad student, one of my advisors was Jed Estee, who is an absolutely brilliant scholar and someone from whom I've learned a very great deal um, and continue to. Mm-hmm. And Jed said, that if, if literary studies has any purchase whatsoever, it has any purpose whatsoever, it is because literary analysis can tell us things about the past that, that other forms of analysis, including textual analysis, cannot tell us. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's what we're doing, right? When, we're, when we are doing literary analysis, we are accessing some, some current in the past that is uh, 
that is otherwise invisible. I think that I agree with that wholeheartedly, but would construe the historical or the past in different terms to Jed. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, if the literary analysis is useful at all, it's because it tells us something about the history of the human subject rather mm-hmm. than the history of nations or the history of classes, uh, which I find a little bit less persuasive, although, you know, this way to under certain circumstances too. So that's why I talk about books and movies a lot. Yeah, yeah. no, that makes sense. And I mean, I, I feel like it's important to say for our listeners, I mean, you've already gotten this, gotten at this already by talking about um, the extent to which the book deals with ontological claims. But I also think, and I'm, I'm thinking about your, your attention to um, technique um, mm-hmm. and to Freud's um, letters on technique, which I agree with you are like quite different um, than, than most of the rest of his, his body of work. Um, and you know, you appeal, I'm thinking about the two terms of the title, right? Pleasure and, and efficacy. And I think it's important to, to link the, the efficacy part, not only with technique, uh, and not only with pragmatism in the philosophical sense as you do, but also in this really like plain language kind of sense, which is you're just like, you can change sexes. You say this in, uh, you yeah. say this in pleasure and efficacy. You say it in, in please miss. Um, there's, there's a line that I really like where you, you call it contesting the impossibility of transition. You've talked about this yeah. already a bit, but I, I, I do think it's important for folks who haven't yet encountered your, your books to just say like, this isn't a claim that that we see in a lot of writing and, you know, reading you, it seems so obvious when you put it this way. And it's, it's empirical. Like, you're like, I did it. Look, mm-hmm. it's, yeah. it's, it, it's yeah. happened. But, but it is this sort of empirical fact with radical conceptual implications. And I, I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, that that's something that our, our listeners get to hear. That, that claim in this very plain language that is, as you say, mediated by... Um, by readings of texts, but also, you know, emerges, I mean, you're writing in so many different genres, um, mm. some of them autobiographical, some of them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's also true. But no, I, I agree. I mean, I think that it seems naive to say you can change sex, but it seems naive because uh, we have swallowed a line about what sex is in the strong ontological yeah. uh, framework where we've absorbed this notion that you know, there's, there's a phrase that I often hear people using um, online, especially the people who are often yelling at me online. It's like every cell in your body screams that you're a man, Scre- screams or screeches in different versions. Um, and I'm, I'm really fascinated by that, that way of thinking about biology as like a set of miniature screams. But again, it's like, it just kind of isn't true. It, you know, it isn't, it isn't true biologically and it, and it isn't true experientially. And you know, for example, yesterday, I mean, yesterday I was being yelled at by Martina Navratilova, which was an extraordinary experience. I did see that. Um, it was, I was, I was honored and stunned. But uh, yeah, what, you know, someone was saying, well, listen, if I put, um, if I put wheat germ into a beef burger, does that make it vegan? And I was like, <laughs> no, but if you put wheat germ into a beef burger, it doesn't become beef. And so yeah. like... <laughs> You know, the idea there is like you think about like the vegan idea is a way of thinking about sex as like actually a kind of purity is the the actual image there. And, you know, it just seems so obvious to me that if we refer to things as possessing that kind of different material substrates, like uh, material predicates, like we refer to testosterone as a sex hormone, you know, then it makes sense to say that, you know, different forms of sexuation can change biologically. I mean, I understand that. Uh, chromosomes don't change, but I don't accept that chromosomes are imminently or phenomenologically apparent to the person who is experiencing the world. So that is to say, everything that we call sex is is in fact, you know, experientially and ontologically uh, changeable. So it, it, it's not, it's, it, it isn't a claim that nothing exists. It's not, I don't think it's, po- you know, I don't think it's the naive postmodernism or relativism. I think I'm just sort of saying, well, the words that we are using conventionally mm-hmm actually allow us to say these things uh, without stretching the conventional meaning of them. Mm -hmm. And in fact, one needs to really freight these words and make words do a lot more than they want to do in order to make sex theme immutable. And of course, there are people in the world who are doing that work day by day to try to make it seem ever more immutable, inviolable, unchangeable, binary, you know, all of these things that are uh, designed to arrest um, and negate the possibility of 
of real just really just common use of words so yeah that that that, that is is pretty central to the work and also to say that one doesn't need to make an identitarian claim about what kind of a person one is in order to transition. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that that's another thing that I think is uh, kind of important. And a mis- it's a mystification yeah. yes. that, that people are told that they need to understand themselves as a, as a man in a woman's body or a woman in a man's body. Or, you know, if they like Barbie, but they have XY chromosomes, they need to do such and such a thing. Or on the other hand, they should be protected from doing such and such a thing. They should be prevented from doing such. You know, all of this seems um, unnecessary to me. We have perfectly good language for describing why people do the things that they do. Yeah. Um, and it's, we use the language of desire. It's something that psychoanalysis is actually really good at. Yeah. Why did you do this? Because I wanted to do it. And it felt good to do it. So I did it again. Um, it, it, it's that simple. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think that we, I don't think we need or, 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 or I don't, I don't think anything more than that helps us at all. This is this is fascinating, and it makes me think about. Um, it just also like we have, I think the, the term ontology is, is germane here in many ways we talk about it right and for those p- people who are in our audience who may not necessarily be familiar with this right ontology is, is, is the philosophical st- study or question is about being right and it and, and I think that it one sort of valence of that that it seems to be operating in, in these conversations that we're talking about and in our conversation right now is it, it's like the it's a way to signal stability I think is absolutely right but also like it operates on the level of like priority urgency or like realness like on, mm, on, what is yeah. ontological is the most real yeah right and, and it's somehow we and, and thus we have to adopt a variety of positions of um you know like lucid acknowledgement of what's real or like uh kind of like disappointing other people by their illusions over what they think is real but what we know not to be in, in other words it becomes this yeah. entire thing about um a, a type of realism and i think you even say this in, in, in your writing on freud and technique like it's, it's a certain type of approach that is a, a is it a statisized style right it's like a way of looking at things as being real and i think yeah to connect this to, to some of the other themes that are on the table here and that also emerge in your book right i think one thing that can happen and i i take your point absolutely that like having common everyday language even theoretical terms too, but just like having language that has some degree of portability across subjects, across disciplines, or just even in the popular realm, uh, is that sometimes a lot of things that seem very sort of straightforwardly real, uh, or rather straightforwardly given in both theoretical language, but also in everyday speech, have a naive ontology underwriting them, right? And, yeah. and or they're talked about in a very sort of specific way, in a very technical way, but only to mystify the very obvious realistic dimensions of them. And, and I think yeah. you talk in your book about the idea of like the, um, I think it's, it's, it's like the, the romance of intractability. Yeah. I right? love that phrase. Which, which is a preoccupation for us too. Cause we, we have, we've been, we've been trying to find this one line in Freud somewhere in, I, I forget where we thought it is, but about how apparently people who are go, it's a line about how people who go into uh, philosophy, theology, uh, jobs that involve pursuing, unknowable, unanswerable problems. It's about how we're obsessional neurotics. Yes, it, it basically that. a symptom. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 you know, I feel very attacked by this, but also, like, it is a... <laughs> I think about that concretely in the terms we're talking about here, uh, but, but an anecdote comes to mind, but it's it's striking how even psychoanalysts, wrote historically, who are supposed to have this ability to, to toggle between the normative and the descriptive, who are supposed to be mm-hmm. both... Um, attuned to sort of the everyday like aspects of life, you know, as they're related, Mm -hmm. but also to the deeper structures, how they themselves can get caught up in certain types of traps uh, or romances of intractability. And, and, and the the story that that comes to my mind and and that I think maybe of some amusing amusement or interest to you was told to me by uh, one of the people I, I, so I also did a a complete degree, right. And I, I, what got me, Mm -hmm. gave me life through that was actually going, getting analytic training at the same time and realizing, oh, these are real people who actually care about certain things. Like we're not going to like decide Mm -hmm. something's a trope and then we're going to leave. Right. Like, like Mm -hmm. we have Mm -hmm. to actually make a decision 
as in terms of an intervention that, that's you know, therapeutic or maybe it'll blow it up. But in any event, there has to make a decision. The conversation can't end with or yeah. being like, actually, this is an undecidable problem, right? That, that's, yeah. you, your, your patient isn't going to tolerate that. But but uh, one of the things that, uh, and I found that very refreshing against sort of a lot of the deconstruction type stuff that I was otherwise being schooled in. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. but, but one of the stories that was told to me by uh, Ralph Routon, uh, who, you know, is a prominent psychoanalyst and for people who may mm-hmm. not know the name, was, was a, uh, a major figure in getting the American Psychoanalytic Association, which, which which kind of dragged its feet on this for a while, to like destigmatize or otherwise uh, position homosexuality as like a, a more or less normal mode of mm-hmm. sexual expression, right? And obviously normal under psychoanalysis is very up in the air, but right. Uh, one of the stories he told me, and I'm probably bringing down two stories here, was like the amount of confusion that he, uh, like sitting in on a paper, that another colleague had given at some point in the seventies. And it was about a, a gay man who uh, had requested his psychoanalyst, who was also an MD to uh, go, give him a prescription to go get a pap smear. Right. Mm. At, which, and so this analyst gives like a entire talk for the better part about how this actually involved a certain identification with the mother and all these other, it was all about mm-hmm. the, the, like the, the genital technical sense meaning of it. And at mm-hmm. a certain point, Ralph or, or one of his friends was just like, well, no, no, if this man is having anal sex, he need, he, he, and he's, he's in his 40s, he act, this is actually an important thing to be done for his yeah. health. There are legitimate health concerns. Like, there, sure, there is this meaning dimension, but there is just mm-hmm. a very basic thing where he's coming to you as a doctor for this procedure. And the people couldn't <laughs> yeah. see this, right? And, and then the flip side of that is like, what I, so it's like there was like that type of like, they were using this terminology to mystify or to mm-hmm. not see something that was, well, as obvious as, as as that could be. Um, but then the flip side of it was also a kind of strange, um, I don't know if the word, I don't know the word Ralph used to describe this, but something I could imagine like a resignation or like a kind of bewilderment or even a type of disappointment mm. that after um, gay men and, and lesbian women were sort of brought into the fold as, you know, it, 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 obviously this is all under certain, I'm throwing up a lot of like quotation marks here, right? Lots of scare quotes. Mm-hmm. We're, we're, course, getting, yeah. we're, we're getting regular psychoanalysis. A lot of psychoanalysts were kind of like deflated to be like, wow, a lot of the relationship problems that these people are having are the same ones that my straight clients have been having. You know, like they're miserable in their yeah. marriages too, right? And, and of course, they're <laughs> not gainsaying the uniqueness of this. What that seemed to suggest was there had been an investment in this category mm. of person as unknowable. Yeah. And that there yeah. had been this romance or an almost a kind of like eroticized fascination with talking about and over them instead of just like using everyday language to ask what their lives were like and what their needs might be. Yeah. And that that had actually, that failure had actually foreclosed much more interesting conversations and also uh, marked a, a failure to deliver that therapeutic good. It's a beautiful story. Yeah, no, it's exactly right. And it, it's not as though um, acknowledging a practical need for a pan smear um, divests that act of theoretical or hermeneutic significance. It's that um, significance uh, is not does not depend upon the absence of function or the absence of efficacy. And actually, we learn, you know, one of the contentions of, of my work, I think, is like we actually learn more hermeneutically, if we think functionally and yes. pragmatically mm-hmm. about um, many of the choices that, that, that people make. You know, I just want to go back to something that you were just saying a moment ago too, Patrick, about, um, you know, what Raymond Williams called the view from, realism as the view from the boardroom, um, which is a phrase that I've always really loved and I, and I cite in, in that chapter. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think one of the sort of, points of this this book, I think, is to think about what we mean when we say something is real. And that is to say, uh, to focus less on the question of what is real and what isn't real, and more on the quest- the question of why we endow certain psychic and political conditions with the character of realness and yeah. others with the character of unrealness. Mm-hmm. And for me, this is where, I know this is not a 19th century literature podcast, but this is really where getting into 19th century literature and realism in particular became so important for me because uh, realism is, you know, it's the, it's the 19th century's big blockbuster uh, literary and, and cultural mode. It, it was a, a, a big and, and massive thing. And I think what what I have argued and what I believe to be the case about George Eliot, who's 
you know, often, and I think rightly thought of as the, the greatest of the realists, is that real is not a property of objects in the world. It's a condition of a person who uh, is, is observing those objects in particular mm. kinds of ways. Mm. And in, in particular, realness has to do with the end of fantasy and yeah. the, uh, the capacity to uh, choose the unlovely truth over the lovely fiction. And of course, you know, in order for that to be possible, and this gets back a little bit to um, Lena Dunham, for that to be possible, one needs to make the assessment of whether something is beautiful or ugly before one can investigate whether or not it's real or unreal. Um, and so that is absolutely, to echo what you were saying, uh, Patrick, a way in which any kind of realism worth the name uh, begins with aesthetic uh, assessment, it begins with aesthetics, uh, and is indissociable from aesthetic judgment, um, which is why I think one of the one of the enemies of this book, or one of the, the kind of primary bugbears of this book, is the form of reasoning that calls itself common sense. Mm, mm-hmm. And uh, you know that's only because I think common sense is often a refusal of the real. It's, it's, I, I don't mean that with a big R in the Lacanian sense. I just mean a refusal of. Uh, although maybe that too. I'm not. I'm not trying to foreclose that either. I just that's not where the word was coming from. In me, you know, it's, it's a refusal to reckon with the elements of the world and its functioning that might be more difficult to describe um, than, than, than first order signification would have us all believe. And it's so often associated, and now I am thinking of Lacan, with the patriarchal, with the law giving, with the name of the father, mm-hmm. um, and with, uh, you know, with, with the the voice that wants to assure us that things are a certain way and that we were right. And we live in the epoch of, of white defensiveness. Mm-hmm. We live in the era of, you know, the most, the most profound retaliation of common sense in the form of Trumpism, you know, a, a common sense driven to the point of absolute madness. You know, there, there is one of the things that I find so consistently interesting about Trumpism is that those who support Trump, those who write articles about Trump, those who 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 you know defend Trump against uh, you know all of the accusations of misconduct, often use the language of you know this is what a sane man looks like in a crazy world, and um, you know that was the title, and that wasn't exactly the title, but something like you know the Democrats are crazy, our man is sane. <laughs> it's the kind of governing theme of. Um, Sarah Huckabee's recent speech as governor of Arkansas, she gave a whole thing that was based on mental, the language of mental illness. And some part of that's merely retaliatory. I mean, it's, it's also the case that liberals love to diagnose Trump with various different kinds of obsessional neuroses. You know, and I'm not interested in diagnoses of any kind. What I'm really interested in is the way that the language of madness is, mm-hmm. is being used uh, to, to, to sort of resist this man who simply refuses to do anything other than tell it like it is. Um, even though the thing that he is telling is incorrect and he has no idea about the way it is. Um, but that's, uh, that's, what, that's what common sense is. You know, common sense is, um, is the position from which Trumpism is the only conceptual framework in which sanity could be articulated. I want to go back to like the two terms that structure the yeah. book because I feel like we have gotten very much, especially with all of this talk of sort of like common sense language, but also ontology. We've, we've gotten quite a bit into sort of like pragmatism. We've gotten into technique. We haven't talked so much, although you have certainly alluded to um, desire. We've got little bits of, of Lacan. But my sense is that there is a vision of, of pleasure that, that animates mm. your work that is not purely um, the sort of Lacanian um, desire, desires, desire kind of, kind of shtick. Um, and I would also say to go back to our earlier conversation about style that, you know, one of the things I feel as I, as one of your readers is a sort of like joy and glee, um, Mm. that I think are, you know, related to this, but I wonder if you can say a little bit to our listeners about what this vision of, of pleasure is. You know, I wish I could quote this exact line from memory because I think I'm, I don't have much to add from a, to a beautiful line from Bassani, which I know is on this desk somewhere, um, <laughs> which is, I think from the beginning of Thoughts and Things, something like the contention of this book is that jouissance is the en- enemy of pleasure. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the, the pursuit of 
uh, the absolute horizon of, it's just like a, a way of saying in like the terms of desire or erotic terms, uh, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's more or less what it comes down to. I think that so much of, and this is an, an essentially political issue too, so much uh, of our contemporary discourse around pleasure seems to depend upon the notion of an ontological shift that no one in their right mind can really think is imminently going to happen. Mm. That is to say, you know, we will feel happy after the revolution. Um, But of course, (laughs) we never have to put that into practice because uh, we don't really expect that the revolution is really going to happen either. Um, So in fact, we, we we will choose melancholia as an ethical position. We will choose... Um, grievance as a kind of um, and as, a, as an aesthetic posture. And that there's writing on grievance that I love. There's writing on melancholia that I love. I've written a lot on melancholia. I'm thinking of Anne Chen, Cheng's work, The Melancholy of Race, which is a really fundamental uh, psychoanalytic work about race and, and melancholia and grievance. Um, but I do think that um, on the other side of this, we can imagine uh, the pleasure that uh, that, for example, sex delivers to us. And uh, the reason why I say, for example, is because over the last 20 years, the, the, the era in which queer theory inexplicably came from far behind to win the, the critical theory wars of the 20, of the aughts and tens, um, you know, it's pr- probably in last place behind deconstruction, Marxism, you know, whatever. But it, but it definitely won. And one of the ways in which it won, I think, was by producing an essentially, as opposed to tactically melancholic, understanding of sexuality, um, grounded in a kind of psychoanalysis that at times felt sort of Lacanian, sort of otherwise. But, you know, if I if this were a lecture on the history of queer theory, one of the things that's interesting about that is that the so-called negative turn or the antisocial turn in queer theory uh, activated and, and, and insisted on the necessity of uh, Leo Bassani's thought in relation to um, HIV AIDS, in relation to you know the refusal of pastoralism in his in his work, like um, is the Rex McGrave and some of those other earlier essays, but Bassani himself actually took a totally different tack and spent the the, te- the twenty tens writing essays that were deeply pleasurable and deeply invested in pleasure, um, pleasure giving and pleasure taking, and. Uh, usually would use the language of aesthetics to describe those forms of pleasure giving and pleasure taking. But clearly anyone who's ever read Bassani knows that there is a profound eros to his understanding of uh, aesthetics. I mean, I don't think that anyone could, could really try to claim otherwise. So, you know, for me, I, I often find when it comes to pleasure and trying to write in the spirit of Bassani trying to change his mind, um, trying mm-hmm. to change his own mind. Because I think that if one were to learn about sexuality and sex exclusively from queer theory written between 2005 and 2020, say, one would get the impression that it was a traumatic encounter uh, that was uh, an essentially kind of grim and depressing experience that did nothing more or less or different than cause people to confront the death drive. And I simply don't think that that's true. I don't mm. think that has very much in common with why people have sex with each other. I have an anecdote about this, which is that, you know, one of my, this is an anecdote from one of my grad students who told me that um, he'd been in some class, maybe it was a theory seminar in which for the queer theory week, they read Eve Sedgwick's truly brilliant essay on uh, Henry James which is on uh, theatricality and shame um, and anal sex. The only thing that's, that's mistaken about it is that uh, Sedgwick gets the word fanny wrong. I mean, something different in the UK. But anyway, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's a brilliant essay and it focuses on shame as a broker for Jamesian style um, and this constriction and expansion of Jamesian style. It's a beautiful argument. And my student said, you know, I have anal sex all the time. I don't feel any shame about it. And I don't really understand why I'm expected to think that shame is a necessary uh, part of anal sex. And of course, you, you know, it's, it, it also has that characteristic of it's so obvious once you say it. But like, the reason why anal sex is associated with shame for someone of Sedgwick's generation is because of 
the legacies of HIV AIDS yeah. and the legacies of that pandemic mm-hmm. um, and the discourses around that pandemic, the discourses around decriminalization of sodomy. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, shame is going to be an essential element of that kind of structure. But in the age of gay liberalism, which is also the age of queer theory, you know, it's not, it's not the case. It yeah. actually is not the case that, you know, people who are, you know, young gay men having anal sex a lot are going to be experiencing shame in any kind of overwhelming way. That, that association is just not going to seem inevitable to them. So that struck me as a moment. It's funny how both our anecdotes are about anal sex, Pat. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, you know, in, in any case, and specifically about the mystification of anal sex. Interesting. <laughs> um, but the, uh, you know, the point about this for me was like, we actually are missing this whole element of sex, which is, um, which is pleasure and, yeah. and the fact that mostly people do it because they want to do it. And mostly people do it because maybe mostly people do it a second time because they enjoyed it the first time. Um, and that's not, uh, there's nothing to be embarrassed about. I mean, it often <laughs> seems like a, like a kind of high school counselor or something, you know, nothing to be embarrassed about, but it, it does sometimes, it does sometimes feel that one has to talk in these terms because, because we choose embarrassment and we, mm. we, 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 have, we have acquired the notion that shame is morally redemptive or yeah. politically radical. And I simply don't think that it is. I think that shame is politically disabling. In fact, I actually would, would go so far as to say that yeah. uh, shame is a luxury we can't afford politically. Yeah. I think about, about shame. And I, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I speak here from as a, as a former Catholic, right? And so, so shame is very, mm. very, very but I, I do think, and, and I'm not sure if I'm, dimly recalling either catechism stuff or, or bad experiences in confession um, or Eve Kosofsky, Sadish Quake or whom, but right. But like, it seems like something about shame that makes it so intractable. And I, I do know there've been a couple of recent volumes about like how, you know, why shame is such a particularly um, intractable thing to, to, to work mm-hmm. with in a clinical context. I mean, if anything, I think to the extent to which we can associate shame with, with self-harm or with, with cases that, mm-hmm. you know, refuse help, we're in, we are in death drive territory if that has a clinical existence, mm-hmm. right? But it does seem to be that like one of those uh, very, I guess, seemingly simplistic definitions of shame, but that now, as opposed to guilt, but that now actually in the way that several things in our conversation that seem simple are actually very, very true is now hitting me all the more, right? Is, is the distinction between like, well, g- guilt is, you feel bad about a thing that you have done, right? Whereas mm-hmm. shame is a, 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 you feel bad about who you are, or even all the feeling that you have is just a badness and your sense of you is just badness. Yeah. So it, it's one thing I think we maybe could, could sort of to tie some things together here is to think about how I think shame it, it, produ- it it well a phrase you use in the book like it, it produces an ontologization yeah right shame makes someone thinks they are an essence. yeah yeah you know, it's exactly right it, you know if one is engaged in any kind of like but let, let me put it this way if you're engaged in any kind of psychic process that seems totally non-relational that's because it's ontologized that's because you have fictionalized a, a being that is capable of non-relationality because in 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 actual in the actual world in the world that we we live in there is no non-relationality. You know, there is like, a, there's no pure sense of relationality either, but the notion that we're all just sort of like light emitting diodes in the dark is obviously, you know, a, a fantasy that serves certain kinds of purposes. But yeah, I think that's right on. I wouldn't say about Catholicism too. Yeah. I'm also a former Catholic and um, unlike many former Catholics my age, I was, I was really in it for a while yeah, mm. in my adolescence. It took me until I was 17, I think, uh-huh. until to, to really sort of uh, find my way out of Catholicism. And I think it, it, it still in certain ways shapes uh, my thought, although I don't think it's especially for me to say how. Um, but one thing that I wonder if you have seen and would encourage you to see if you haven't is Midnight Mass, I think which is the, good? Yeah, uh, yeah. The, the, it's a Netflix show made by Mike Flanagan. Um, and I find Mike Flanagan's stuff sort of hit and miss. I think he's when he's good, he's very good. But at the core of this is the performance of Hamish Linklater as a priest. And there's this extraordinary balance in Hamish Linklater's performance between utter uh, bombastic domination of the world around him and complete inability to even articulate his words, like mm. a complete failure of nerve. Uh, and it's so perfectly realistic it's to me of the it so perfectly depicts the priest that i grew up with um again there's the like oscillations between timidity and charisma 
Um, and I don't know that I've seen it quite so beautifully depicted anywhere as in that show. Awesome. Yeah. I will watch that. Uh, yeah, I left the church at, at 18 too. It was my, uh, it was like, and I was like an altar boy. People, I, people in our parish were praying for me to become a priest. Like it was a, yeah. No. No. Well, that's what, it's one of the reasons why we find psychoanalysis, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so speaking of shame, can we talk about, about the idea that I, I know this was an essay before it was, was in the book, but I really wanted to talk about your idea of egg theory. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been, I've been, uh, both entertained and also edified by, by a, like, I mean, I remember your, your bit on like weed theory, Coke theory also, um, yeah. from a long time ago, but I, I, I wanted in particular, um, to talk, to ask you to talk about this idea of, of egg theory, um, I think in the context of shame, certainly. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And also, um, just to, to draw this out for folks who have not, not read the book is, um, the tension that comes out um, between queer theory and trans studies, um, which I will say that, you know, when I introduce that in like, cause I, I teach intro to gender studies, um, all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll sometimes read, um, we read a lot of Susan Stryker. Um, we'll often read, um, my words to Victor Frankenstein, and then we'll read that follow up, um, years later, where she calls transgender studies queer theory's evil twin. Um, and mm-hmm. you're using a different idiom, but I do think that mm-hmm. um, one of the things that is really important for, for readers to get at in Pleasure and Efficacy, um, and this is linked to your claims about Sedgwick, but not exclusively, is this tension and often outright hostility between the era of queer theory that you were talking about um, just a little while mm-hmm. ago um, and I guess what we might call trans theory. And I think that the, the the idea that you bring out or that you name and bring into being, call into being here, um, of egg theory is really helpful. So can you talk mm. to our listeners a little bit about that idea? Yeah, so I'm happy to. And, and I, I will I will not assume that anyone sort of is uh, especially attuned to that valence of egg. Egg is a word that people um, in the trans community often used to describe uh, a person who is uh, not yet transitioning uh, or a person who has yet to transition. And the idea is that the the egg cracks and a chick comes out. Mm -hmm. So the egg, the condition of the egg before it cracks is something that uh, is necessarily, I think, projected backwards. Um, it, it It is true that one sometimes sees people uh, saying of someone that they have an eggy vibe um, and that and that sort of makes sense to me, although it's not something that I, I guess I, I say or think about very often. And then I've even one time heard someone describe themselves to me as an egg, uh, which actually made no sense because I, I mean, I was like, my understanding of this word is that um, it can only describe something prior to transition, such that even articulating that there is a transition in the future would indicate that the egg had cracked and therefore in some sense wasn't an egg. But, you know, I'm not here to police people's use of words. And of course, (laughs) words uh, change their function and meaning over time anyway. Um, But that's what an egg is. So, you know, to to go back to the sort of broader institutional question, one of the things that had happened, I think, to queer studies by the end of the teens um, had been a kind of emphasis on a particular kind of historicism. Um, and that historicism derived on the one hand from a kind of early Foucauldian understanding of institutional history, uh, and on the other hand from a sometimes uh, conflictual relation to black feminism, especially the work of Cortez Spillers, who I think it's sort of become one of the most important, if not the most important theorist of, of the moment. So that, that was a kind of interesting moment, especially in sort of American studies, which was the de facto home for queer studies. The queer studies doesn't have an annual conference, mm-hmm. um, but American studies, you know, in practice became the center of that. And because American studies is essentially a kind of cultural studies discipline, I think queer studies had become part of this, um, you know, this, this fairly hybrid form. Um, and as a result, a lot of the work that was coming out of queer studies really did not by that time understand itself as theory at all. Mm -hmm. 
It understood itself as a form of historical annotation. So one of the things that I think I wanted to do was to say, well, you think that's not theory, but it actually is theory. Um, there, are the- there are theories here that are operative that you are not acknowledging or avowing. And two, those theories are often designed in certain ways to repress or negate the possibility of transition. And so that, that was the purpose of egg theory. Mm-hmm. You know, the way that egg theory emerges in the, in the essay that became a chapter is colloquially, you know, people have theories about why they shouldn't transition. It often seems to be the case uh, that people will begin transitioning by saying, I want to transition, but, you know, what am I going to do? Just start taking hormones, that's not going to do anything. It's not going to change my fundamental sense of myself. What am I going to do? Have some kind of surgery, have a pair of tits slapped on my chest? That's not going to make any kind of difference to anyone. Um, and these kinds of negations, which are like parts of what, you know, I, I've called a romance of intractability in this book, um, are also theories in themselves. Yeah. They're not not merely romances. They are, they are normative claims about the world and um, about what happiness might look like or what satisfaction might look like. Um, it may also be that within the sort of specifically queer theoretical setting, these arguments about about the impossibility of transition, which are, which are not themselves ethical arguments. It's not anyone says transition is bad, you shouldn't do it. It's just like transition is naive, it won't work. Right. That's sort of the argument. Yeah. But that often takes a kind of transmisogynist specifically uh, kind of turn where theory begins to emerge subtly that, you know, trans women are acting out of a kind of melancholic attachment to the figure of the mother, to mm-hmm. go back to Pat's anecdote, um, which is only ever going to reinscribe the negative uh, and never amount to anything. You know, this is more or less what Zizek says constantly whenever he's asked this question, yeah. which he is surprisingly often, that he sees um, transition as a negation or a refusal to live with the castration right. complex, which strikes me as a perverse way of thinking about mm-hmm. these terms, but, but potentially a defensible one. I, I don't really know. In any case, you know, there's this trans women are deluded, trans women are, um, uh, are potentially even psychotic, trans women are melancholic, and trans men, trans masculine people are going along with it out of some kind of mis- misplaced sense of solidarity um, with the effect that, that lesbians are now losing ground mm-hmm. and that there's some kind of implied uh, contest between lesbians and trans women for the souls of masculine AFAB people. Um, and, you know, obviously, I think anyone who has thought about that for more than a second can see that uh, while what motivates that argument is, is trans misogyny, the primary target is actually uh, trans men yeah. um, who, are, who are the ones making the bad choices, supposedly. Um, and who are guilty of this thing that gets called butch flight. Um, and so it's a kind of a, a butch flight being the idea that, uh, you know, we, we lesbians are losing butchers to, to trans people, trans ideology, whatever you want to call it. And so again, you know, I saw some of these ideas emerging in this kind of um, soft, understated historicism of uh, queer theory at the time when I was when I was trying to compose these ideas, mm-hmm. and then I tried to figure out how exactly that happened because it seemed obvious to me that um, Spillers and the Black feminists and the Afro pessimists who are also being cited, you know, like totally return of theory with the capital T, um, like absolutely, you know, Spillers is a demanian in so many ways. I mean, the kind of like engagements of um, Contemporary black feminism and Afro-pessimism seem to me to be profoundly contrary to conventional historicisms, actually. But we're being kind of like dissolved within this sort of soft core historicism that was ubiquitous. And I was thinking, well, I think one of the reasons for this is that three of the major figures of queer theory had late in life half-articulated uh, turns towards trans masculinity. Yeah. yeah. Those three being Eve Sedgwick, Judith Butler and Lauren Ballant. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and those three figures are maybe the, th- well, no, because I just want to say D.A. Miller and Leo Bassani too, but they are among the most important figures in, in, in my thinking and in, in, in this book. Um, but it is so interesting that the three of them had such 
difficulty articulating their relation to trans masculinity. Yeah. In Sedgwick, um, that comes out as, yeah, hostility. And, mm-hmm. you know, one of my readers' reports um, used the word rage to describe Sedgwick's response mm-hmm. to tr- the possibility of transition um, in the parts that I quote. And I think that's right. I mean, I do think that, like, in white glasses, there is something like rage. And in How to Bring Your Kids Up Gay, there's something like rage. And, you know, that's interesting. And I think it's difficult not to think that that rage is connected to the half articulations of desire around masculinity and about sort of, you know, the various forms of identification with gay male culture, gay male subjectivity. But, you know, I mean, Lauren Ballant, I think, understood himself as trans by the end of their career. And in fact, it said uh, in an interview with Charlie uh, Monkbrighter that they'd always understood themselves as trans. That had always been part of it. They'd never felt a need to sort of publicize or politicize it. Um, but, you know, when I pointed that out to people um, after, after Berlant had died, again, there was a sort of like really extraordinarily uh, wounded response mm-hmm. um, because it was as though a kind of co op I was performing a kind of co-option or trans people were performing a kind of like uh, you know, posthumous conversion yeah. through a bunch of Mormons mm-hmm. or something. Yeah. And, you know, that was interesting to me because actually the essential difference that was being asserted in those fights was not between queer women and trans masculine people and trans men. The essential difference was between public and private because the claim was always that, you know, maybe Ballant was, um, was, trans in public but anyone who knew this person privately knew that this person was a woman and never really had much track and they were never expected to use they pronouns to describe them and the reason why i find that especially bitter and especially ironic is because if um if there is a consistent thread in lauren bland's extraordinary of it is a negation of the public private distinction yeah yeah, um, yeah. And, a, and a refusal of the priority of the private and, you know, public feelings is absolutely the kind of central theme of, their, yeah. of that work. And so it's interesting to me to see that something like egg theory, which is, you know, the generalizable theory that transition is impossible and, you know, we shouldn't acknowledge it. And we, we, we prefer indeterminacy. We prefer especially mm-hmm. transmasculine forms of non-identity. Um, you know, that all of that, I think resuscitate public private distinctions in a way that you know i thought we'd moved on from i mean i think one of the things that i really love about Berlant and warner is their commitment to to public and to counter public Mm -hmm. um and i see that in bassani's work too i mean bassani is someone who seems mostly to talk about things that happen behind closed doors but on the other hand you know like sex is always public in bassani too if you think about like the the book intimacies which um you know he co-authored with with Adam Phillips. It's a book about public intimacies and in some ways it's a book about public sex. Um, especially after um, your your piece, your recent piece in the LARB, I wanted to you know bring up some other dimensions to to your work, specifically the activist dimensions. Um, so you are, yeah. I mean, I do see you as as an activist and a public figure in that, um, mm-hmm. as well as an academic. Um, and you know, as as really comes out in in Please Miss, there's a visibility to that, um, in, in, especially online. Uh, that can be weird and distressing and it can be a source of connection and it can be a lot of, a lot of things. Um, can we talk a little bit about your experiences in different communities and about the reception of your work in them? Mm. You know, we're certainly interested in, in responses from the analytic community. Um, but there's also, um, I mean, there's also an international dimension to this that we wanted to explore since, transphobia yeah. and specifically transmisogyny is such a um it's a, it's a quilting point right for for politics and not just on the right but in the US in the UK in the academy yeah. beyond yeah yeah no it's a, it's an important set of questions um so you know i 
I'm glad to be talking to people who understand psychoanalysis because I often feel that there's something people are sort of, I find it sometimes difficult to articulate how I got into the public advocacy work that I do Uh um, because it often seems as though people think it's a sort of, it's a service that I am providing the world, which, you know, or alternatively, they think of it as a purely self-serving form of self-promotion. It's neither of those things exactly. Um, you know, I think I got into it because I felt uh, I felt two things were true about me. That one, I had more and greater job security than pretty much any other trans woman in the country. Um, and that placed upon me certain kinds of responsibilities. And two, I was a British person living in the mm. United States of America and therefore had a capacity to try to explain the cultural quilting to use that really beautiful image that you just used Abby, to people on either side of it um so those two things felt like they, they were sort of uh, capacitating or you know in some ways placed an obligation on me to act in a certain way you know when i got tenure um my friend rachel ablo uh, who teaches at suny buffalo um said to me the next thing is you have to get yourself arrested tenure means you get yourself arrested <laughs> And I admired that so much then, and I admire it so much now, um, that, you know, so much of the work that Rachel does and that I want to do is she puts her body between students and harm. Yeah. And often that means between the bodies of her students and the bodies of cops. Yeah. But uh, it may also be the bodies of students and the bodies of those who are attempting to prevent them from doing what they want with them. Mm -hmm. Um, or describing them in ways that make sense to them. And so, you know, that that sort of became the the immediate shorthand goal. We are experiencing a political crisis. I have both, um, by virtue of my, you know, British in the US position and my tenure, uh, a special set of skills and responsibilities. And then, it, you know, at some point it becomes some, something else, though, because it mm. becomes its own logic and it becomes... It becomes itself a form of civic participation and it brings out the Catholic priest in me, had to go back mm-hmm. to that. You know, it brings out, I'm trying to minister to the needy where mm. I, I find myself adopting this very, um, you know, forgiving and generous and gentle tone where I'm patiently explaining things to people who are calling me a rapist and a pedophile every day. You know, and one of the things that my husband has said to me many times, which is just straight up true, is like, you are much nicer to people online who genuinely want you dead yeah than people who actually are moved by your work and want to uh you know engage <laughs> you. you you ignore those people um, that is something and, i say to my husband all the time yeah, yeah, <laughs> literally yeah, yeah, that's the idea. yeah, yeah. interesting yeah <laughs> i mean in a sense i think that the, the catholicism is a connection too uh-huh. because there is a sort of like greater rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repenter but the thing about it is i mean at the beginning of all of this, when I just started to get into fights on Twitter, mm-hmm. the thing that really seemed obvious to me is like, oh, look, there are some, some category errors here. I can actually solve them. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we shouldn't be deciding uh, who, who should be allowed to do what based on the percentage of this or that hormone or you know, protein inhibitor or whatever it is. Those things are obviously secondary questions to really important conceptual ones. But at a certain point, you just get sucked into the madness. And like, suddenly you're no longer thinking about those kinds of questions and you're thinking about the the minutiae in a way that's really damaging and because so much of anti-trans activism and frankly trans activism too so much of it is so paranoid and so organized around these conspiratorial modes of thought that you know to to tarry with it is to become contaminated by this Mm. sort of um complete uh over uh, complete and overwhelming paranoia and you know, to go back to Cedric, I mean, yeah. Cedric's right about paranoia. It's not very useful. It doesn't actually get, um, it doesn't get political work done. So I, um, I find myself in a kind of cycle where I become obsessed for a while. You know, eventually one of my partners will say, look, you're getting obsessed. And I'll be like, yeah, you're right. And then I'll stop. And, you know, ideally I kind of think I need to actually like take, steps to get sober from this in a, in a in a more profound way getting sober when you're already sober is sort of harder though because mm-hmm. uh you know one of the things you learn getting sober when you're getting sober the first time is that at least i learned i didn't really choose to get sober it just sort of happened and i went with it 
Um, one day I woke up and I felt an opportunity and then I just sort of ran with it. But, you know, if you don't feel the opportunity, it doesn't really happen. You know, it's like, sometimes I wonder how useful any of this is. Have I ever changed anyone's mind? Have I ever presented a point of view that anyone finds convincing? What does it mean that I talk to these people who hate me more than the people who actually want to engage my work seriously? Mm. You know, I, I I don't think I've got this right, to be honest. I, I don't think that um I don't think I've got the answers to this. I think I think I need to keep working and keep thinking. I think I have drawn some fire and that's good. Mm. I think I am good at explaining things and that's good. The LARB piece was very widely read and that's good. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm grateful for that and I'm 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 grateful that that stuff is, you know moving forward and, and and I think that there's such this such a strange chokehold over legacy media around trans issues. Yeah. I think because, you know, what what people love about trans issues, what, what people really want trans issues to be is finally a conflict of rights. Yeah. Where both mm-hmm. parties can have, you know, valuable things to say. Both parties can have competing interests and we can finally acknowledge it mm-hmm. um, rather than pretending everything is all in the same maelstrom of like, we're all gradually moving towards a rainbow future. I think people really love the idea of competing interests and especially journalists and especially liberal journalists. Yeah. And so, you know, Ron DeSantis doesn't care that uh, feminists and trans people have some kind of conflict with each other of course not he hates both of us you know from the perspective of the right this kind of competing interest model is extremely useful but you know that doesn't itself discredit it it just it's just true but in any case i mean the point for me is like that story of competing interests it's a compelling fantasy but it is in fact a fantasy there are not competing interests in fact uh it's harder to say uh, our rights depend upon each other in really fundamental senses. But it is true that we are not free until we're all free. And, you know, that means you're fucking, you know, the people you think of as as, as creepy, as wrong. Uh, the, the one thing that I take is absolutely essential from the, the golden age of queer theory, you know, is like we are coalitional or nothing. Yeah. You know, queer yeah. either names a coalition or it just might as well pack up and go home. Mm-hmm. And the degree to which... Uh, you know, it, it 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 is used to name like cooler than thou. Uh, my sexuality is so interesting. You know, identity practices. I mean, bullshit to all of that. The only thing that matters is like actually, coalition is how we come together and and and, and get gay liberalism happened because of queer because of because of queer coalition. Yeah, and we may, of course, rightly, you know, critique the various forms of gay liberalism that have neutralized parts of our community and have made certain kinds of life invisible and intolerable. I understand and, and, and respect that. And I share D.A. Miller's view of it. I share Heather Love's view of it. Mm. You know, I, I, under, I share David Eng's view of it. But at the same time, I don't see any of those people thinking it would just be better if actually um, gay people couldn't marry. Uh, like, I don't even think Lee Edelman would say that. I think it's like, this is the wrong thing to aim for, Yes. But as a basic marker of like what it means to be a human being in the world, like I think that gay liberalism has done some good and mm. it was only possible because of coalitions. Yeah. So that's how I feel now. And I feel that, you know, it's sometimes like I see people who are 20 years younger than me describing themselves in terms that I think doesn't make any sense to me. Um, you know, I find those, those pronouns kind of odd or I find that way of thinking about your own relation to desire or commitment or you know the the kind of taxonomic drive i find these things kind of like disorienting and difficult to handle but it's always just like people feel that way about me um you know these people will feel that way about other people 20 years from now Mm -hmm. and the only thing that is worth holding on to is that we all need each other and like there are fewer fascists than there are anti-fascists there are way more anti-fascists in the world but the but the fascists actually know how to work together and we kind of don't um and so that's that's the project it's like learning how to live together learning how to work together yeah um i don't think we're gonna find a a, a, lovely that's that's a lovely note for us to to begin to to wrap up on i do want to say um we have we have like ranged uh through many texts which i which i will drop yeah. in the show notes but um one of the things that that we really love about our listeners is they're always 
asking us mm. for reading recommendations, which is like, you know, it's when, when, I mean, Grace, I feel like you can probably relate to the idea of like trying to get people to do the reading. So when you have then suddenly like a mass of people who are like, could you please give me more reading? You're like, yes, oh my God. yes. yes. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Talk about traversing the fantasy. Um, mm. But I wonder if you can offer up some of your favorite specifically psychoanalytic texts or, you know, it doesn't have to be favorite. It could mm. be just ones that you've returned to any, you know, yeah. 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 No, it's a, it's a, it's a fabulous question. I mean, so I often think about how Derrida's um, favorite essay of Freud's is the note upon the mystic writing pad, yeah. which is this weird three page essay. And, you know, it's a great essay and Derrida does a hell of a lot with it. Um, in his, you know, in his essay on the subject, Freud and the scene of writing in uh, writing in difference. Mm-hmm. I'm not necessarily recommending that text, although it is amazing, but it's extremely hard going. Yes. But the point that I, I <laughs> one of the things that I take, from it um, is that there's pleasure to be found in Freud's little byways and his yeah. little out of the way asides. He's someone who, you know, often would like write a little thing and then um, toss it aside. Like there's a little, everyone knows the joke book, but there's a short essay called On Humor, which I really like, which is kind of contrary to the claims of the joke book, which is a fun one. And then, you know, my favorite Freud text is probably it's probably analysis terminable and interminable, mm-hmm. which I mentioned before, which is like widely underread, I think. Yeah. Um, in terms of psychoanalytic uh, criticism or later psychoanalytic writing, um, I've mentioned D.A. Miller a lot. You know, I don't know whether Miller would describe himself as a, as a psychoanalytic thinker at all. I think in some ways he'd probably be quite skeptical of that, um, that idea. But um, his book, Place for Us, Essay on the Broadway Musical, uh, mm-hmm. is, a, is, a, is a book that, has taught me a very great deal about psychoanalysis and has taught me a very great deal about cultural criticism. Um, so if you are someone who enjoys Broadway musicals, you will love it. But also if you're just someone who is interested in thinking about cultural criticism and its relation to, you know, psychic modeling or psychic models of collectivity or collective models of psyche, um, I think that's a really, really wonderful text. Um, I'm also like motivated to recommend texts that like, I love kind of getting mad at mm. like Joan Kopchek's read my desire, mm. um, you know, which is a book I really admire. And I also kind of like chafe at quite a lot as I often do with Kopchek's writing, which, you know, of course is really wonderful. General note on Lacan, though I assume other people have got their first, but this one is like, don't start with the écrit. They're shorter, mm-hmm. but they don't make sense until you've read the, um, at least some of the seminar. So, mm. uh, you know, I mentioned this, the ethics of psychoanalysis. I think that's a pretty good one. Yeah. Um, and uh, that, that one's also been really important to me. If you're interested in psychoanalysis as something, you know, to keep thinking with in the longer term, you have to get a copy of Le Planche and Pontalis's Dictionary of Psychoanalytic yeah. Ideas. Um, it's a book that I have consulted and probably cited in literally every essay I've ever written. Yeah, um, indispensable. Because, you know, I think it's, uh, I think it's, I think it's it's necessary, and then I'll end by by mentioning someone who I know you did um, a, a, an episode on, who is just such a a major figure in my own thinking about about Freud and also about writing, and you know the kind of writer I want to be is Janet Malcolm. Mm-hmm. You know, Janet Malcolm is a complicated figure in so many different ways, but I think there is just so much in in the Freud Museum mm-hmm. that uh, more than in the Impossible Profession, which I also enjoy, but for, for different reasons. But the, but the Freud Archive is the uh, is the one for me where it really, mm. um, I don't know, it, 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 it creates a sense of the historicity of psychoanalysis as, a, as an ethnography proper to New York City. Um, it creates a sense of psychoanalysis as something utopian, but also as something utopian that broke a long time ago yeah. um, and potentially can be fixed and fixable, but, but not exactly clear how. Um, I think it's I think it's a really really wonderful work of investigative journalism and psychoanalytic criticism. Yeah. Um, amazing, marvelous. Thank you so much, Grace. This has been like just a joy to talk with you today. Thank you. This was so much fun. This has been an episode of Ordinary Unhappiness, a podcast about psychoanalysis, politics, pop culture, and the ways we suffer now. I'm Abby Kluchin, and today I was joined by Patrick Blanchfield and Grace Lavery. This podcast is produced by Dan Yowell. Theme music by Formal Chicken. <laughs>